narrative, again, is following the Apostle Paul. He had his opportunity, you might say, to preach the gospel there to the religious Jews on the Temple Mount, which was uh, his uh, desire. And, uh, and of course, that, uh, uh, from man's perspective, that didn't go well. A, a riot broke out, and the, uh, basically the uh, Roman commander, Claudius Lysias, has to kind of storm down with a couple of hundred guys and, uh, and rescue the Apostle Paul. Uh, remember then they wanted to find more information about Paul, what this was all about. He was about ready to have Paul scourged in the same way that Jesus was scourged. Uh, Paul had mentioned at that point that he was a Roman citizen, which meant that everybody involved could face the death penalty for what they had done to this Roman citizen, just to bind him in, uh, in irons, much less the uh, uh, possible scourging. Uh, and so we talked about the fact that uh, Paul now has a little favor here, you know, with, with these guys because he doesn't seem to be pressing charges against them. Uh, and, uh, and that's going to uh, play into the, uh, the narrative uh, as this continues. Uh, again, it's been about 18 years since the Apostle Paul uh, has met with the Sanhedrin. It's been 18 years since he left them with letters from them in his hands to go to Damascus to persecute uh, the uh, Christian believers there. Uh, he knows all these guys uh, very, very well. Uh, and maybe even before I, I read this, just to keep in mind, is, uh, is the Roman commander, he's got to come up with some kind of official charges, something to do with Paul. So he figures he'll, he'll bring him back to the, the uh, uh, reigning council there, the 70 members uh, that are made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. Uh, they didn't have a, a lot of love for one another. Uh, again, the Sadducees were the, the liberals of their day. They didn't believe in divine revelation. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe uh, in angels. They didn't believe in miracles and so forth. They were the liberals of the day. Uh, they are, the high priests and his family are all Sadducees and then a portion of the, of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the other group, of course, is the Pharisees, uh, who Paul is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were well respected by the people in that day. Um, certainly they were... They were legalistic like on steroids in terms of keeping the law and so forth, and we'd have a lot of uh, issues with that. And when they get saved, <laughs> they bring some of those issues uh, into the early church, certainly, and we've seen some of that. Uh, but uh, they are well respected by the people, the Sanhedrin, in a sense. They have no respect for them because they're not following God's law at all, and uh, they're so liberal uh, in their, their uh, view of God's word and uh, in his intervention in their lives and so forth. So you got two very diverse groups of people. Uh, the man I, uh, that uh, is here, again, uh, Annas or Ananias or Ananias. We'll call him Ananias. Uh, he is the uh, uh, high priest at this time. Uh, he has taken the place uh, of, his, of his son who's been killed. Uh, who took the place of uh, Caiaphas. So there's been a little turnover uh, with uh, his particular office. Uh, and he's a very corrupt uh, individual. Uh, he's an individual who, uh, when the, uh, the priests would receive the tithes that the people brought in, they, and that's a tenth of, but the tenth of is like their, uh, their, their produce from their fields and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. It was their livelihood uh, under God's provision for them. Uh, and this man... Uh, Ananias would actually demand to take a portion of the tithes for himself, and if they refused, he'd have them beaten. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was a brutal guy, and uh, that's going to play into Paul's response to him uh, in our narrative as well. well. Let's look at the first 10 verses. We're kind of uh, framing the practical aspect of this in terms of the title of the message, The Cure for Discouragement, because we're going to see Paul at the lowest point in his life, spiritually and emotionally. Uh, God's going to bring some encouragement to him, uh, and it is a pattern. We see it in the life of Joseph, the life of Job. It seems to be the same thing. The way that God encourages Paul here is the same way that he encourages us today. Well, let's uh, look at the first 10 verses, and we're saying that Paul, the Pharisee, very important, will divide the council against itself. Uh, he will need to do that. Then Paul Looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and you do command me to be struck contrary to the law. And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, 
You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided, for Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confessed both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanding the soldiers to go down to take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. You can only imagine what the Romans are <laughs> thinking about uh, uh, all of this. And again, we've talked about this before. This is 71 Jewish guys screaming at the top of their voice. That's how they discuss things. When it says, and they cried out, it means they cried out. And it was, uh, it was allowed and there was a lot of commotion going on. The poor Roman guys thinking, yeah, we'll just go to this little council. We'll get a little information. We'll get this thing worked out here. And uh, Paul's about uh, torn into pieces uh, <laughs> once again. A couple of things to kind of walk us back through this. Uh, notice uh, in verse 1, Paul looking uh, uh, earnestly at the council. And we're seeing that he's addressing uh, men that he, that he knew well. So he grows. a lot of these guys you grow up with. I mean, again, Paul's a Pharisee. He comes to uh, Jerusalem at a very young age. We know from his own confession that he is... Uh, he has risen above his own peers in terms of the hierarchy of the Sanhedrin uh, and being a Pharisee. Uh, so when he's looking, this is the same word that's used for the apostles when Jesus ascends into heaven. When Jesus ascended to heaven, I don't think they went, hey, there he goes. What, what do you want to do the rest of the day? No, I think they would stood and looked very intently as long as they could. Uh, so this is... Uh, he, he, you have the sense that he's looking at everybody in there, kind of sizing them up in a sense, uh, you know, I know you, you know me, you know, I know what you guys believe exactly. Uh, and, uh, and there's an intent uh, look going on by the Apostle Paul. And then he says, my brothers, which is very informal. It's like, you guys know me and I know you, my brothers. Uh, and then he makes the reference to having a good conscience in verse 1 also. <coughs> I have lived in all good conscience uh, before God uh, until this day. Two key uh, phrases here. One is the word lived. It means to live as a citizen. That's where we get our English word uh, politics. Paul uses it in Philippians. For our citizenship, our politics is in heaven. It's the same word. Uh, he's affirming the fact that he's been a loyal Jew. Now they, they know, it's been 18 years, but they know the Apostle Paul has been out uh, basically planting churches that are made up of Jews and Gentiles together throughout uh, Western Turkey, uh, throughout Greece, uh, and, uh, and a little further north uh, there of the Aegean Sea. Uh, and he's been at it for a while. That he goes into the synagogues and reasons or proves from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, he wins many converts over to the, the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. They're not too happy about that. They're even less happy about the fact that then he brings uh, uh, Gentiles into this Jewish sect called the way uh, at, uh, at that time. They're aware, aware of all of these things. And so when he says, and I have lived as a good citizen, they're like, uh, no, you haven't. You know, they're, 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 they're already a, a little upset right now. And then he says, and I've done it with a good conscience, uh, a very key word Paul likes to use. He uses it twice in Acts. He uses it 21 times in his letters. It means to know with uh, or to know together. Sometimes we say the, the conscience is the, uh, the inner judge or the inner w witness. It doesn't set a standard, but uh, uh, basically it applies a standard. If you have a good standard coming from God's word, your conscience will bear witness uh, whether what you're doing is right or not. Sometimes we say our conscience is like the windows that allows God's light to come in through his word. The problem is sometimes the windows get dirty and there's not enough light coming in. But it only applies the standard. A thief could have a standard and feel have a guilty conscience if he rats out on one of his friends. It's, uh, it's not because he's a real righteous person. It's just he has a conscience. It isn't the standard. It applies the standard. And here the idea of the conscience and the reason he gets slapped is he's able to say, 
I, through my good conscience, the way I've lived, I've been a good, faithful Jew all of this time. Uh, and I can be a good, faithful Jew as a Christian and as a Jew. I don't see a problem. I don't see a difference. And I say this before God Almighty in a sense. And the high priest went, slap that guy. <laughs> Which was, by the way, against, uh, against uh, the law for him to do that. And that's what Paul says to him. Uh, which uh, again is in verse 2, 2 and 3, uh, where that's why they, they slap him. Uh, and then Paul uh, remarks, then, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. And then he, he quotes the scriptures, for you sit in judgment according to the law, and do you command, uh, uh, command me to be struck contrary to, to the law? Uh, there's, there's a little controversy here, you know, just the, the stuff I'm reading. A lot of people believe that... Um, that uh, Paul basically kind of shot off his mouth a little too soon here. <laughs> and yet, you have a sense that he gets whacked in the face. He doesn't go, now let me think about my proper response here. Yes, I will say this. You have a sense that he says, hey, you whitewash wall. I mean, again, there's a lot of yelling going on here. This is not a, a low-key kind of a deal. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, that's Paul in the flesh. You know, we talk Romans 6, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you struggle with the flesh. That's Paul in the flesh. Uh, uh, you know, and then, and then when he's kind of reprimanded for it, hey, you talking to the high priest that way? Man, I didn't know the guy was a high priest. Some people say, well, he wasn't talking to the high priest. He was talking to the guy who slapped him. Well, it doesn't matter. They're all part of the ruling elders, and he's supposed to be careful what he says according to the law of Moses uh, to all of them. So what's really going, uh, going on here? Uh, well, I, I don't think that Paul was in sin. I think he did. Shoot, shoot his mouth up pretty quick. But I, th I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Edersheim, who's the great uh, Jewish uh, writer, uh, uh, says that uh, he thinks that uh, Paul said this because the high priest just kind of uh, didn't have his, his priestly robes on and so forth. It's been 18 years. Uh, he didn't even recognize uh, that he was the high priest. He just thought he was one of the other guys. I, I don't think that was, uh, that was it at, uh, at all. Paul is simply saying by saying you're, you're a whitewashed wall, you're a hypocrite. Now, they're the same guys. Jesus said you're whited sepulchers. In other words, you're a tomb that, uh, during, again, during the feast days, they would whitewash them, uh, paint them, because if you're walking through a field uh, or through a place and you happen to touch something where someone was buried, it would make you unclean, so they would whitewash them. So Jesus says to them, you look good on the outside, but you're rotten on the inside. That's what Jesus said to the same group of, uh, uh, group of men. John the Baptist called them snakes, a brood of brood of vipers. So neither of them were very complimentary uh, <laughs> against uh, uh, the Jewish leadership during this time. And oh, by the way, this is not a Gentile opinion. According to Jewish history, this was the lowest point in time in terms of, of corruption uh, and immorality uh, among the Jewish leadership uh, there in uh, Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, and so Paul spoke against this man, Ananias, who was the high priest. He was, uh, he was no, no good guy uh, at all. And uh, I've already mentioned a little bit of the background. Uh, because they had a tendency to sell out and be sympathetic towards the Romans uh, during the uh, Jewish revolt in 66 AD, uh, Ananias fled to Herod's palace. Uh, Jewish soldiers caught him and killed him right, right on the spot just to get rid of the guy. So he's not a real popular guy. He's not respected uh, at all. So was Paul sinning when he said this? Well, in verse 5 when he says, I didn't know, brethren, uh, that he was the high priest. Uh, and when he says, I did not know or I did not realize, can also be translated, I do not acknowledge. I don't acknowledge the guy's the high priest. The guy's absolutely corrupt. He doesn't believe in the word of God. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. He doesn't believe in God's divine intervention. He, do, they don't, he doesn't believe in miracles. He doesn't believe in angels. I don't acknowledge him as the high priest. Uh, I don't think he was sinning uh, in saying that. Uh, I think he's just basically saying what is the truth. He's saying that I am not going to submit to you. I submit to God instead. You are no authority over me, which is similar to what Peter, James, and John went through when they were commanded not to teach any longer in the name of Jesus. They said, who should we obey? You guys or God? I think we're going with God on this one. Uh, and of course, they uh, were beaten and then rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer some of the shame that uh, Jesus did. 
Uh, again, Paul says, uh, uh, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So he acknowledges here uh, that he is the ruler, uh, but I don't think he's really kind of uh, uh, walking back on, on what he had just said in terms of this man and being such a, a, a hypocrite. Now, we would say the same thing today against those that uh, embrace uh, liberal theology. And uh, they, they always conveniently come out with some, some new interesting concept or discovery about Jesus right around Easter time that supposedly refutes the resurrection or refutes the uh, uh, accuracy of God's word and so forth. And uh, they've got their PhDs and THDs and so forth, but obviously they don't know the Lord. Most of them have probably never read the Bible, uh, but they've got all the criticism of it. And of course, the media embraces them, runs it as their, as their cover story and so forth. I remember there was a big controversy a number of years ago, for example, one of those type churches, the Episcopal Church, uh, when it uh, ordained Jane Robinson, the first openly practicing uh, gay homosexual man to be a bishop within that church. And people were like, man, how did we get here? I remember Chuck Colson said, I don't know why people are surprised at that. They've been ordaining non-Christians for 60 years. I mean, come on. If you, if, if, uh, if you get together because you like Jesus and think he was a good guy and a really good teacher, and you like what he said on the Sermon on the Mount, and that's all you got, I don't think you're really a Christian. And uh, so this is who Ananias is. I don't really think Paul's in sin. I think he's pretty accurate here. You're an, a, a hypocrite. I don't really acknowledge you really are a high priest. Uh, you can't deny all these things uh, about God, his existence, his care for us, and so forth, uh, and still be uh, uh, the high priest that should be over the people of God. So again, Paul the Pharisee proclaims the resurrection of the dead. So he jumps in in verse 6. When he perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out. It cried out means it was, he was loud. He was shouting. Uh, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Uh, it's in an imperfect tense, crying out, which means it's continual. In other words, he's shouting this really loud, like for a long time, <laughs> to, try to, to try to get over uh, everybody else's voices uh, and uh, all the other confusion that's going on. He gets popped in the mouth. He shoots off at the guy, and there's a little exchange, and then <laughs> there's, a, there's a little bit that, uh, of, a, uh, of a riot that breaks out, which is all very normal conversation. This is just how things went with these guys. We don't really know what the Sanhedrin was set up like. We know they weren't seated. They are were all standing for this. Uh, you'd have to believe that the Pharisees were on one side and the Sadducees on the other. Otherwise, that would be a lot of fistfights and stuff going on. Uh, but, uh, and Paul seems to be in the middle of, of it because he literally is, will read later, is, is, is they're about ready to tear him apart. He's with us. No, he's with us. And uh, uh, the commander there has to uh, intervene. Why does he bring up the issue of the resurrection at this juncture? I think there's two reasons. One, he has to realize is that <laughs> with, with the little exchange that he begins with saying, I'm, <laughs> that very offensive statement <laughs> about having lived with a good conscience, that gets him popped in the mouth right away. I think he's going to say, uh, th I think this is going to go south here pretty quick. Uh, and uh, if memory serves me right, uh, Jesus stood before these guys and they crucified him. And uh, I think they'll just take me out and stone me. Uh, and I'll be dead here very soon. Uh, so, but if I, I bring up the issue of the resurrection, uh, he, he knew this would happen. This is, these guys have been having this argument for a thousand years. So uh, he would uh, bring it right to the front burners. I think that's one of the reasons he does that, just for, uh, in a sense, to escape what's about ready to happen to him within the Sanhedrin. But I think also he brings it up because he always did. It was the centerpiece of his sermons, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead, he would tell the church in Corinth, man, our, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. Uh, he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Uh, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Uh, and if, this, if in this life uh, we hope uh, only in Christ, we of all men are the most to be pitied. So uh, he's basically saying, man, if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, all bets are off. 
If Christ hasn't risen from the dead, we're still in our sins. If Christ hasn't risen from the dead, we're preaching a false gospel. If Christ hasn't risen from the dead, uh, the people that have already died are not going to rise either, and neither will we one day. And the only hope we have in this life is this life. I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, but he, obviously he goes on and proclaims beautifully there uh, and talks about the, the resurrected body that we will receive uh, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. It was the centerpiece for everything that he said and he did. I don't think he could help himself. In a way, yes, I think it was a ploy. He realized, uh, I better engage the boys here a little bit before they take me out and kill me. Uh, but I think it was, there was part of him that was hoping that he could get the message of the resurrection in there as well. Paul the Pharisee, he ended up having to divide the council. Now we'll see in verse 11, 22, God's providential care and rescue for the Apostle Paul. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, uh, we've bound ourselves under a great oath that uh, uh, we'll eat nothing until we've killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that uh, he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you're going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went inside, and I asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in, in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink uh, until they have killed him, and now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one you have revealed these things to me. Uh, you know, we read that, and it's like, uh, there's a lot of questions come to mind right away. Is that, uh, uh, is that like a normal thing for some kid to walk in and go, I want to see my uncle over there, he's, uh, one of your prisoners? Oh, yes, sir, young man, just walk this way. And he's always like, get out of here, kid. Uh, this is not a normal thing I mean, for this kid to be just ushered into Paul. I mean, that, but they do it. Why? Because that's the guy that if he reports and several guys are going to get killed. Hey, you know Paul, you come with me. And then he tells Paul, hey, Take this kid to the commander. Yes, sir, prisoner Paul. I mean, it's none of this is normal here. Uh, if this whole thing hadn't happened with Paul, and Paul hadn't revealed that he was a Roman citizen, this kid doesn't get past the front door. Uh, much less the commander. This from the, <laughs> this is Paul, the prisoner's nephew. Well, here, young man, you just this Roman commander. You you just come right in here and tell me what you have to say. This, these things just don't happen. Uh, uh, but what we see in it is God's providential care. Uh, and certainly uh, we see very importantly first uh, that that includes the presence of the Lord. Look at uh, verse 11. We mentioned probably the lowest time in Paul's life. Uh, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. Uh, Paul, as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you mu must also bear witness at Rome. So uh, again, the commonality of people that uh, in the Bible that go through horrific things in their life and seem to not go to cynicism and they seem not to go to bitterness, uh, bitterness or, or despair. How, how is it that the men like Joseph, like Job and others do what they do? Uh, and it's because they have always had a sense that no matter what was going on, God was with them. God's presence was with them. I read a book a number of years ago called The uh, Survivor's Club. It's a secular book. It's not a Christian book. The guy that's writing it uh, interviews all kind of people, uh, former POWs from Vietnam more that spent years in prison, uh, people that had uh, undergone uh, like a mountain lion attack, uh, people that had survived uh, plane crashes in the wilderness and so forth. You're like, 
you're pretty morbid there, aren't you, Pastor Tim? But yeah, no, it was actually yeah, interesting. But anyway, the, the commonality of these guys and this guy who's a non-believer in hearing all their stories in the end, he said the people that survived had uh, uh, certain things in common. And one is faith. They all believed that God was with them, that God knew, that God had a reason, that God had allowed it, and God had a plan to get them out. And that's why, because it was all about attitude. It was all about their attitude in that captivity or whatever the circumstances was. There was the difference between life and death. And we certainly see that not just in a, in a secular guy's uh, research, but we see it in the Bible in men like Joseph and Job uh, in here, Paul. Uh, and so the Lord appears to him uh, in his presence being with him uh, makes all the difference uh, in the world. Uh, there's uh, only a few times that, that it happens. Uh, Paul mentioned it last week. He was... Um, uh, he comes to Jerusalem for the first time. He's in the temple praying, and, and, and the Lord uh, appeared to him. Uh, when he's very discouraged in Corinth, when he first gets there, you remember uh, we studied that together, and the Lord uh, came to him and said, Hey, I'm with you here. I got a lot of people in this city. Don't be discouraged. And Paul continues uh, the ministry there in, in Corinth. <clears throat> now, at this period of time, later during the storm in chapter 27, when the boat's going down, the Lord uh, encourages him there. And during his trial, he mentions the Lord coming to him in 2 Timothy 4.16. So his presence is with him. Lo, I am with you always as the assurance for all believers. Secondly, his providential rescue uh, by a promise here, the take courage. And I have to admit, uh, you know, I'm reading my, uh, my New King James, uh, and it says, uh, and the Lord said, uh, be of good cheer. Uh, I, I use that expression all the time. Uh, so that's when I have to, okay, what does that really mean? Uh, that means take courage. Uh, and it's a phrase that's uh, only used by Jesus. It's one Greek word. It's only used by Jesus on five different occasions. Uh, when, when the four guys are, are lowering their buddy through the roof that time because they can't get to Jesus because of the crowds and he's paralyzed and uh, uh, Jesus uh, heals him and says, uh, uh, be, of good, uh, be of good cheer or take courage, your sins are forgiven. That's one of the times he uses it. Uh, when the, uh, the gal uh, has uh, been, had the issue of blood for 12 years, spent all of her money on doctors and all that, and uh, uh, HMSC canceled her policy, uh, she's in tough shape, uh, and she comes up and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Uh, he, he says the same thing to her. He says, uh, take courage, take courage. Uh, and when the uh, uh, disciples are, are out on the, the professional fishermen are out on the Sea of Galilee and they're pretty sure they're all going to die, you know, Jesus comes in walking at night. He says, take, take courage. Uh, it's the same word. Uh, in the upper room, when he's trying to tell them, I'm going to get crucified, but you guys, <laughs> you guys take, take courage. So it's a very unique word that Jesus uses only five times in the New Testament. Four in the Gospels and this that's why I think it's such a critical juncture in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He comes to him and tells him to take courage. Uh, God's presence can encourage us. Our circumstances can discourage us. And then he gives him a, a commendation. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. Now, somebody could have asked Paul, one of the other prisoners, you know, uh, uh, how things uh, went there in Jerusalem. I know that it was your, it was your dream to one day share your testimony uh, with the religious Jews there on the, on the Temple Mount. You've lived your whole life for that moment. How'd it go? Well, you know, not, not too well. There was a riot and they tried to kill me. Oh, that's, that's, doesn't that sound bad? That sounds bad. But Jesus comes and says, you know what, Paul? That was awesome. That was awesome. As you shared your testimony there, you're going to do that in Rome. Same way. Same way. This is meant to be a, a commendation. We, see, we kind of measure things differently. We're kind of the very re results-oriented. We talked last week about, uh, about Paul's testimony being a model, a clear before Christ, how he came to Christ, after Christ. That becomes the model for us. That's the effective testimony. We talked about there's three different types, but that's the adult conversion that about uh, half of us uh, uh, have. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes we share our testimony and we're like, oh, okay, I don't think that went too well. Uh, you know, actually, we don't really know that. And it, you know what? That's not even the issue. Not, the results is not the issue. In a sense, we're the mailman. We deliver our testimony. We deliver the gospel. Uh, the other person opens up and reads it. How they respond to God's message is, is between them and the Lord. It's up to the Lord. God looks at Paul, which could have been seen as a very bad thing, and says, you did really good, man. 
and I'm going to take you all the way to Rome. You're going to, you're going to do the same thing. You know that thing I said to you at the beginning? You're going to have to suffer? <laughs> well, I know you know that part, but um, I said you'd appear before kings. That's going to happen. It's all going to happen, Paul. And, uh, and uh, the Lord comes to him. Uh, it's his presence, uh, and it's these uh, promises that he's giving to him uh, that's encouraging uh, the, the apostle Paul. Again, the Lord was pleased with his testimony, uh, and that's all that really counts. In the final analysis, if everybody loves you but you fail the Lord, I don't think you're in real good shape. But if everybody is not too happy with you, uh, but you've been faithful to Jesus, I'd say you're in pretty good shape. You know, it's, you, know you can't please everybody, so let's focus on, on, on the Lord. It's just how it's going to be. When I was still building stained glass windows for a living, I... I did all the traditional kinds of things, so I was able to, I did the painting, staining, enameling, and uh, etching, and uh, all, the, all the technical stuff, so I could restore all of the uh, uh, windows at St. Andrew's Cathedral and a, a lot of the other churches uh, in, uh, in town. There weren't too many people that could do uh, all of that, you know, very traditional technique and so forth. That, that was really not my thing, you know. My own work was very, very contemporary, and, um, uh, you know, and I used a, I used a lot of a lot of clear textures uh, and a lot of whites and a lot of black, black. Yeah, I used a lot of black glass. People say, well, that doesn't really sound too good. You know, I like those windows with a lot of color in them. I didn't use a lot of color, and and, uh, and most people didn't really care for my work. And you know what? I, in fact, I've, I've been, I had a piece in a show in downtown in a gallery, and I happened to be sitting in the show. Uh, and someone actually that I knew uh, came in and, <laughs> and looked right at my window and said, what's that? You know, I mean, that, that would be a, your typical response to a lot of the stuff that I did. You know, you know it's like that commercial, that, you know, the McDonald's commercial and the guys are in the gallery. Do I get a lot of that. And, uh, you know, I was okay with it uh, because the, the gal that wrote the, uh, uh, the reviews for those shows, uh, for the advertiser at the time, she loved my stuff. She had all kinds of great things about it. Uh, the top architects, jury designers, they seemed to like it. They, they'd buy, buy, buy a lot of it. And uh, so I, I was okay because that's how I earned a living. I, I was okay with a lot of people not liking it, as long as a few key people, <laughs> the one that writes those big checks like it. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm really okay. You can insult me all day and all, all night. I'm okay with it, you know, because you know, when it really counted, those, those people liked it. Uh, and that needs to be our attitude in terms of uh, sharing the gospel, uh, being comforted uh, by the Lord here. Paul is commended. Uh, and then the confidence, so you must also bear witness uh, in Rome, uh, leaders that lied about him, fanatics that tried to kill him, government officials ignored him, but either way, uh, God's got a, a ticket for him, and he's got to take him to Rome. Strux Wendall in his uh, book about the Apostle Paul says this, survival seems next to impossible until uh, the Lord intervenes. At that point, we realize he has a bigger plan than we could possibly have imagined. Often in the midst of great pain or on the heels of discouragement, the Lord appears in his word, providing peace through his spirit. He whispers, I've got everything under control. You're right where you're supposed to be. Just as you serve me faithfully here, you're going to be my witness there. Amazing, isn't it? About the time Paul might think it's curtains in Jerusalem, he's promised a guaranteed ticket to Rome. I think Paul slept like a baby. Divine reassurance is a great cure for insomnia. And I just love the last line since I suffer for it once in a while. <laughs> Divine reassurance is a great cure for uh, insomnia. Uh, that helps, doesn't it? Uh, when you're really going through something, the Lord shows up and goes, read this. Read this right here. That, that applies to you. That applies to you. And you're, you might want to underline that right there. You might want to write in a little card, and put it in your pocket. And, All right, I'm trusting the Lord. Uh, that's what he's saying to the Apostle Paul here. It'll be two long years before he shows up and does that. You'll testify me before in Rome. How long is that going to be? Uh, just trust me. It's going to be two years sitting in prison, waiting. And uh, I'm sure Paul brought this scene to mind and these words to mind many times, as should we. Sometimes we're discouraged in our, our own relationship with the Lord, but Paul tells uh, tells us this in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Wish you were a little further along in the sanctification process? Uh, well, it's going to happen. It's all going to happen. God's going to pull it off in the end. He's going to complete the good work that he began uh, in you. It's a work by his spirit in us. 
uh, and he is going to complete it. Was, uh, was uh, God faithful to his word? Over in Acts 28, 30, in the end, saying to Paul in Rome, then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house there in Rome and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And we also know from uh, his letter, uh, from his letters, uh, that through his influence in the ministry in Rome, uh, again, Claudius is, uh, we'll talk about him in a minute, Claudius is the uh, Caesar right now. We're in about 58 AD. Paul's going to uh, uh, be there in Caesarea Maritima. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of it uh, next week uh, for two years and then eventually get to Rome. Uh, and by the time he gets there, Nero is on the throne. And we know from his writing that uh, uh, many in Nero's own household have come to faith in Christ, including his wife and his mother-in-law, both, both of whom he executes because of their, uh, their faith in Jesus Christ, as many others. Uh, God does get uh, Paul to Rome. He promised to do it, uh, and he does it. Augustine said, trust the past to the mercy of God, the present to his love, and the future to his providence. That God is in control. He does have a plan. Now, it's interesting. The nephew shows up, and we don't, we don't know anything about Paul's family in Jerusalem. We don't know where this kid comes from. Okay, well, well, how does he know about this whole thing? Well, uh, he could have been like Paul, brought to Jerusalem as a promising rabbinical student, as Paul was, as a young, young, very young guy, young kid, uh, and so he's in one of those rabbinical schools. I guess this was you know, common knowledge, and you know, we could speculate about how he came to know this and, and so forth, but uh, the real reason is because God made sure he knew it. God put him somewhere where he would hear it. Uh, God put it on his heart to go try to save his uncle. As far as we know, none of Paul's uh, family members have come to faith in Christ. Oh, by the way, uh, when he says of his own life, you know what, I've forsaken all for Christ. We don't know anything about Paul's family. As far as we know, none of them get saved. But uh, God puts it on the heart of this young kid, puts him in the right place, gets him in, and then uh, sets, sets the table, in a sense, so he can walk into a Roman jail with an escort to see his uncle. And when Paul says, take this kid to see the commander, it's like, yes, sir. <laughs> he, he takes him right in. And then the commander's like, oh, you're Paul's, Paul's nephew? Oh, please, please come right in. Would you like a cup of tea or anything? You know, this is like just not normal stuff. But uh, God's sovereignty is, uh, and his fingerprints are all over this story. Again, what helps in our time of need is his presence, his promises, and to know that he has a plan. In June 1926, a young missionary in his young 20s, I have a picture of him, Raymond Edmund fell sick from the typhus, a missionary in Ecuador. Uh, he is brought down to a, a seaport uh, town, uh, Guadalquivir, so that his, uh, there was an American physician that could look after him. And basically, uh, when he got there, by the time his widow showed up, uh, it was in time to pretty much hear the doctor pronounce him dead. He said, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's only got uh, a little bit to live. Uh, and so they actually set the date of his funeral, uh, July 4th, uh, 3, 3 p.m., 1926. Uh, he's going to get buried. Made a little recovery <laughs> and in 1967 uh, as the fourth president of Wheaton College. Uh, he's preaching uh, in his pulpit uh, where he suffers a heart attack and, and dies in the pulpit. His sermon that day? In the presence of the king. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. The whole point is that God's servants are immortal until their work is done. Uh, no servant of God dies a premature death. I was, um, I, I was with a uh, you know, family party a couple of weekends ago with uh, Uncle Stanley. Uncle Stanley's 93. He's like a Charlie. He's just <laughs> full of vigor, very sharp guy, uh, and loves the Lord. Reads the Bible every day. <laughs> and his parents... Uh, you know, love the Lord. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, when we were kids, this is on the big island, uh, living in the plantation over there, uh, the, mother, the mother told him, yeah, if you don't go to church in Sunday school, you don't eat on Sunday. So you take your pick. He goes, I missed a couple of meals and I started going to church. <laughs> Hardcore. But uh, he, uh, he loves the Lord. And he was uh, just telling me about, uh, uh, about his, his dad, uh, who lived to be 104. 
He says, you know, but I, I, was, I was his caretaker, and I felt bad because my father wanted to be 105. He just wanted to be 105. And oh, maybe if I'd have done a better job taking care of him, like, hey, everybody goes on time. It's appointed once for man to die and then to judgment. That's awesome, man, that you took care of your dad. Besides that, he's with the Lord rejoicing. I doubt if he'd want to come back and make 105. Because we all go on time. And uh, the way that God was in control of, uh, of Dr. Edmund, as he became known later, uh, is uh, certainly evident that. I, I'm going to read you this one quote. You may have heard it, but not realize we're at the source of it. But uh, uh, our missionary that we're talking about here had said, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. That's a great line. You know, when you're going through the dark times, don't start doubting what God told you in the good times. You know, he is there. He has a plan. Uh, he's there to uh, encourage us. And uh, providentially, the way he's looking over Paul, uh, he does us as well. Uh, and then the third thing, verse 23 to 35, Paul is protected uh, by God's plan. Uh, and he called two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring it safely to Felix, the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor, Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Kind of omitted the, you know, almost scourging him part, you know, as he kind of let that go. Uh, and when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before the council. I found out he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him, deserving death or chains, and was told me, that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from, and when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come, and he commanded him to be kept, kept in Herod's Hilton. Well, kind of, it's Praetorium, so it's a pretty good dig, so it falls in there in, uh, in Caesarea. Now, again, uh, uh, these guys uh, are, are amazing in terms of the, of the escort. If you do the numbers, it's uh, 472 guys. That's half the men that are at the, at the Antonia Fortress. They usually had about 1,000 guys that are there. So they, uh, they march them out uh, at uh, 9 o'clock at night. Uh, they do a forced march uh, 30 miles to get to uh, Antipatris. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Do you guys ever have to do that? Awesome, man. I walk 12 and I'm just dying, you know, I go on these hikes, but uh, I have to sleep for a week. But uh, 30, 30, not, not bad for the guys on the horses, of course, but uh, the uh, spearmen, as well as the, uh, uh, the infantry guys, as well as the uh, guys on horses, 470 some guys, uh, they get there. Ken Yu says, uh, Paul left on town on horseback, surrounded by 470 soldiers. He left town more like a king than a criminal. Meanwhile, his assassins were left in town fighting insistent hunger pains. Think about those guys. We won't eat or drink until we've killed the Apostle Paul. I think after a couple of days, they went to McDavid's and got a burger. I just don't think they really hung in there. You know, it's, a, it's another 27 in Caesarea. I don't think they're going, we're not going 57 miles. And that guy's locked up in, uh, in the Caesarea Hilton. We're not getting to him. So uh, we're just, let's just go get something to eat here. But uh, God is uh, in control of, of Paul's life. And, uh, and very evidently and obviously at what was probably the darkest time of his life. Uh, protected by a letter of uh, introduction, which would have been uh, certainly necessary and needed given the fact of who he's uh, being uh, introduced to. And of course, Claudius paints himself in the most uh, honorable light as possible. Uh, and then lastly, introduced to uh, a brutal ruler. I gotta tell you a little bit about uh, Antonius Felix. And uh, he's gonna be in our in our story for, for a while. Uh, you don't have to watch the Discovery Channel later or anything. It's not going to be on the test, but just uh, a little background. This guy is, uh, is very interesting. He was originally born a slave, <coughs> and he received his, free, his freedom from Claudius. Claudius is the Caesar right there in Rome. His mother is the one that gave Felix his, uh, his freedom, uh, as did his younger uh, brother. His younger brother is the treasurer currently to the Caesar. It means 
He grew up with a guy that is the Caesar. His brother is working for him. He's pretty well connected. Uh, they're, they're right to the top guys. Uh, and uh, you think, well, how, well, how's he end up down in Judea? It wasn't exactly a, a choice assignment. Uh, well, it's because uh, he's a brutal guy. He is a brutal man. Uh, and they wanted him down there uh, because they wanted to deal with the constant problems they were having with the Jews in, in Judea. While Paul's in prison, we know historically, while Paul's in prison, these two years, a riot breaks out in Caesarea between, between we'll just say, the, uh, the Jews that believe in Jesus, the Messiah, and the ones that don't. And there's arguments, and a riot breaks out. His solution? Send in the Roman soldiers and just kill them all. That's, that's how this guy broke up a riot. He just killed them all. The Egyptian that we mentioned uh, in chapter 21... Uh, that uh, the uh, Claudius Lysias mentioned and says, yeah, aren't you the Egyptian? you got 4,000 guys out in the desert and all that. We know from history this guy had 40,000 followers. This guy hunted him down and had him executed. This guy didn't mess around. He, he, is a, uh, he is a brutal guy. His wife is Jewish. We'll meet her. Her name is Drusilla. She's the daughter of Herod the Grip of the first who left her first husband to become Felix's wife. By the way, he's got three wives. Uh, and this, uh, one of his wives is the, is the daughter of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. So he, he's got uh, several wives. Uh, he grows up in the household of Caesar, basically, uh, the affluence of Rome, uh, which brought to him a tremendous immorality uh, in his own life. Uh, and he's a, he's a brutal man. Uh, he is referred to by Tacitus uh, when he says, he exercised the power of a king and the spirit of a slave. He's referred to by historians as a vulgar ruffian uh, and certainly lived uh, up to his name. And he is no friend of Ananias and the Sanhedrin. He don't like those religious guys down there in Jerusalem. So he's going to protect the Apostle Paul. It's just interesting how this all works out. If, if, if you know, the, the table could have been set differently where Paul shows up and he's like, I don't even have time for you. Just kill him now. But because of the charges against him and because the problem was a problem with Ananias, a guy that he despised, it's like, uh, put them in the Hilton there and we'll see these guys when they show up later. I, I'm not making light of it. They put them in a pretty nice place there when it says the Praetorium. Uh, and and God, you just see God in control of all of this. Um, Paul probably felt like, again, uh, you know, he said, I would give up my salvation if the Jewish people could get saved. That was his heart and that was his dream. And it was crushed before his very eyes. And it could seem like you know, it was all over. And then Jesus shows up and says, you know what? Hey, courage, man. You did awesome. And you know, it's not over. You're going to Rome. Because that was his other big dream. He wanted to get to the big Roman cities. He got to Corinth, the center of sexuality, sensuality. He got to Ephesus, the center of the occult. Uh, and he got to Ephesus. Uh, he got to Athens, uh, the center of the intellectual world of the day. But he wants to get to Rome. That's the center of the government and the power of Rome. If you get something going there, encourage the believers there. That was his dream. And, of course, to go on from there into Spain. Uh, God wasn't through with the Apostle Paul's life. The cure for discouragement is to be in the presence of God, uh, the promises he made to us, and to remember that he has a, a plan for us. Out from down in the deepest dark, a rising fire and light. You come rushing like the wind and burning like a flame to fill the night. A voice of thunder, full of wonder, of abundance, heaven's triumph, heaven's glory. Down the walls and calling every nation, every tongue, every daughter, every son, every father, every mother, every stranger, everyone to become a living soul, to become a vessel full, to come alive and walk the land as a light, to be the one who rises high to be. Holy fire, our only burden is to love every load of heaven's love on our shoulders. Our only burden is to love a heavy load of heaven's love on our shoulders. On our 
name and his peace and his grace and love. Follow him. In Jesus' name. Amen.